Seymour with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, April 17th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Professor John D. Erickson, Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at the University of Vermont, author of The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. Then, Justin Allo and Matt Leitchinger, both of Teamsters, one local 542 in San Diego, the other local 804 in New York. On the deadline that is passed to get the supplemental and local contracts with UPS done in anticipation of a potential strike happening at the end of July. Also on the program today, Sam Alito fr uh, freezes Mifeprestone decision for five days. And folks, rest easy. Clarence Thomas has decided he will amend his financial disclosure forms to unhide the other transactions he had with a billionaire. He's just trying to do the right thing. The start of the De Fox Dominion suit pushed till tomorrow by the judge for unknown reasons. Kevin McCarthy appropriately heads to Wall Street to discuss his debt ceiling hostage taking plan, which includes bouncing low income people from food stamps. Supreme Court to hear a Christian mail carrier's case for him not to work on Sundays. Faculty a union reaches a tentative deal with Rutgers University. And the Republican-led lawmakers in Iowa will spend big bucks to kick people off of food stamps locally. Mass shooting in Alabama leaves four dead and 28 injured at a 16-year-old's birthday party. Meanwhile, a black teen shot in Kansas for knocking on the wrong door in trying to pick up his younger sister. Mike Pompeo out of the Republican primary and Nikki Haley... Turns out to be really, really bad campaign fundraising math. And lastly, in a victory against democracy, Macron succeeds in raising France's retirement age despite widespread disapproval. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, here guest hosting <laughs> <laughs> with uh, Emma. Uh, gosh, Emma, I've, I've completely uh, spaced. What was a oh, vigilant, right? Yeah, I was, uh, I was not here also with Bradley. I just can't remember any any of what's going on here. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm back. Want to just first say, um, great job to Emma and Bradley. Uh, got rave reviews. Wow. Uh, was also uh, apparently a little busy of a week <laughs> a or so. Bit, yeah. Uh, week, and a, week and a half almost. Um, I am uh, fully uh, matzahed and Passovered out. Um, I'm going to just, as the show progresses, I'm going to tell a little background about myself so people get, uh, get familiar people with who, who I am. People know who you are, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, just got back from a, uh, from a trip uh, with the kids. I went uh, to London. That's in uh, England, it yeah. turns out. And uh, was there for uh, about six or seven days. Stayed at a friend's place. We had a great time. Uh, ran into a couple of fans of the show. 
It's amazing. On the, on the tube. And one night I went out, went out one night to a bar. Whoa. Yep. Or a and pub. A pub. Well, it was, it was sort of like a bar. Okay. Um, and uh, met a fan of the show, musician. Yeah. Great guitarist. It was really, uh, I was amazed. Awesome. Um, and I uh, uh, had a great time. And, you know, occasionally would look on Twitter and see that things get were getting a little out of hand at different places. But uh, we'll get into that uh, later in the fun app. We've got a lot to cover today. We've got uh, a couple of different guests. We really want to have the Teamsters on because uh, folks have to start gearing up for what could be a massive, massive strike um, uh, midway through the summer. So uh, get ready for that. We will talk about that in a moment. In the meantime, um, the fact that this is even an issue at this point, We've been talking about this for over a year, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, Diane Feinstein, there was every indication possible. And I imagine it's like one of those, like, everybody knows it uh, on the Hill and all the reporters know it in Washington, D.C. Diane Feinstein appears to be really incapable of doing her job. And um, I, I, I... It was more than a year, right? Because it was the Amy Coney Barrett hearings where she is giving maskless hugs to Lindsey Graham and, and ushering her through, even though it was like one of the most consequential Supreme Court nominations for women's rights and for democracy ever. Without a doubt. But I'm not even talking about like doing her job poorly or doing a bad. <laughs> I'm just talking about it. It appears that she is literally incapable right. of doing her job. And um, I can assure you. I have great sympathy with that type of situation going through it right now uh, with my own family. But the fact of the matter is, this is not about a, an individual. This is about millions of people getting representation in this country and a, you know, uh, the thinnest of margins in the Senate. And the one thing that the Democrats can do right now, and credit where credit's due, Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden have done a very good job of this, fill judicial seats. Every day we see the implications of having the federal judiciary stacked by Donald Trump and uh, Leonard Leo at the Federalist Society. This is a crucial, crucial function of the Democratic Party right now. Really, the only, largely, the the, the their primary function, really, in terms of lasting uh, implications. Um, here is Amy Klobuchar. Attempting, for whatever reason, I don't know, to be diplomatic uh, on ABC's This Week. But I think what she's saying is, is pretty clear. At least it is to me. Well, I think she made the right decision to step off the Judiciary Committee. I serve on that committee. And we cannot advance judges or legislation um, with a missing person because of the close votes. So basically, in the next week or so, you're going to see Senator Schumer, probably sooner than later, putting forward a name. And then the Senate, as they've done in the past, uh, can vote to put this person on unanimously. That's what happened when you had Bob Dole resigning to run for office. But you don't think Republicans are going to try to block that? I don't know. I sure hope not, because that is against the precedent of the Senate and how we've run things. But that's the first thing. So she did the right thing. As for the long term, uh, many people have been out, as you know, for periods of time when they're sick and they have come back. Um, in this case, we are going to need her vote on the Senate floor eventually. We have things like the debt ceiling coming up. But I think what we need to do is take her at her word. She is recovering from shingles and make sure she comes back. If this goes on month after month after month, then she's going to have to make a decision with her family and her friends about what her future holds. Because this isn't just about California. It's also about the nation. And we just can't with this one vote margin um, and expect every other person to be there every single time. So it's going to become an issue as the months go by. All right. First off, um, the Republicans are going to block her replacement on the judiciary. The, the, the Democrats will ultimately be able to get around it, but it will kill precious time in terms of where, where the Senate could otherwise be confirming judges. Mm -hmm. This is why she should have stepped down Months and months and months ago. Everybody knew this was coming to a head. I don't even know if she has the capacity to step down at this point. Um, 
She may recover from shingles, but she's not going to recover from dementia. Yeah. I mean, and that was a stronger tack than even Bernie Sanders took on the Sunday talk shows yesterday, by the way. I have a Klobuchar, that's she's being diplomatic there, but everyone else is kind of saying, well, it's her personal decision. I don't, I don't give a crap about her personal decision. We have to stack the judiciary with as many uh, judges as possible because women's rights are under threat trans rights and more i mean it's like this is not about her and her tenure this is about the country it's about the country and it's not her vote it is the it is california's vote and um we need that vote in the senate and the idea that people are going to play this game um now hopefully there's stuff going on behind the scenes that we can't see and this is the face they want to put out there but again it's like I, I don't, I mean, I don't know if it's like a, a Senate, you know, comedy. Here's my theory. Here's my theory, too. Uh, Newsom said that he wanted, if she, I think she were to step down to appoint a black woman uh, two years ago, he said that to that seat. That would, in this instance, seem to be Barbara Lee. And so if she were to be the senator in the interim, that would give her a leg up in this contested race to replace her. So I think there's a lot of kind of touchiness behind the scenes because Barbara Lee is angling to be the replacement in the Senate for Feinstein. And there are other people, obviously, Adam Schiff's folks, uh, Katie Porter's folks who don't want that to happen for their purposes. So there's a lot of just different machinations here uh, that we're dealing with. The idea that this wasn't even gamed out uh, a long time ago is ridiculous. And, um, And Klobuchar knows she's not returning to the Senate. She's not going to return to the Senate. If she's not capable of sitting on the judiciary, she's not capable of doing anything. And um, uh, the sooner she resigns and is replaced, the better. And if they got to figure out a way of making it not have implications for uh, the, uh, the, the upcoming election, then they should do it. But this is a failure of, of Chuck Schumer's because this was completely predictable, completely totally predictable if somebody couldn't get uh, diane feinstein to resign eight months ago nine months ago when it you know was first reported that she didn't even know where she was half the time yeah. it wasn't not going to be any easier now and uh it it, it really just I, I i it's it's hard to know if this is like senate comedy here um and, and they're just trying to be you know sort of like uh respectful or or what or if it's if they're in some way, God knows why, like responding to conservatives who are saying, like, they're throwing Diane Feinstein under the bus. What? Yeah, and we, just, we just First went all, through this with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I mean, are we seriously going to make it about and this Breyer. girl boss? And well, Breyer, But, but too. Breyer did the right thing. I mean, he was... Well, he, well, he did after it way pushing, late. I agree. Breyer did it way late. But it was... But strategic resignations are something that the Democrats need to, like, get serious about. I mean, this is insane. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um... Just got an IM from Andrew Druk, Andrew K. Uh, <laughs> would people be arguing that it's Feinstein's personal decision if she were a truck driver or a pilot? Of course not. Right. Of course not. Um, she needs to resign. She needs to resign today. And if there's anybody around her that is that that is in a position to do this, the, the, you know, they need to make that happen. How else are they getting things done? There are people making decisions for her right now. Right. You know, I guess there's a certain amount of momentum that can happen in that situation. And nobody wants to take the uh, fault. But what needs to happen is every single Democratic senator needs to tell that staff, you will not be held liable if you fire, if if you, if you put out a thing that she's going to resign. And maybe like actually grease the wheels and say, we'll give you a job somewhere else. Is the staff actually, I mean, we don't, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? A couple words from our sponsor today before we get to the guest. Oh, this is great. Um, I, I assume you've you've been reading this, but uh, Sunset Lake is doing uh, their 420 sale. They are doing um, 30% off all of their CBD uh, products with the coupon code 420. Orders over 150 bucks will get a free 20 count jar of gummies, either Sour Bears, Good Vibe gummies, or Sleep gummies. I love those sleep gummies. I'm also enjoying the good vibe gummies. Oh yeah, just I'm not going to joke good vibes about all that. Around. But here's the uh, here's the most important part: five percent of all proceeds are going to be donated to the Last Prisoner Project, 
this is a um, project that uh, organization that deals with the direct legal intervention, direct constituent support, advocacy campaigns, policy change to get some uh, carceral changes. And we will be matching that 5%. So uh, 5% of their proceeds, and then whatever that figure is, we're going to match it. Uh, we've done this uh, over the past couple of years, raised tens of thousands of dollars uh, for the various organizations. Uh, Sunset Lake Sabade is, um, oh, I think I forgot to say uh, Sabade before. Oh, you... I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, uh, they're turning the classic stoner holiday into a fundraiser for the Last Prisoner Project. It is a nonprofit organization. It is dedicated to cannabis criminal justice reform, which is uh, really in the news now, particularly like in New York State has been doing a very good job in terms of like uh, awarding uh, distribution uh, to, to people who have, you know, been imprisoned because of cannabis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 100, uh, orders $150 or more will get a free jar of gummies of their choice. Use the code 420. You will get 30% off. This is a great time to stack up, uh, this, you know, store up. Mm-hmm. You get that uh, the the free gar, uh, jar of gummies. You get the thirty percent off with the coupon code four twenty. Um, on my trip, I can tell you, uh, I brought the I brought both uh, the um, good vibes, the good vibes, nice. and the melatonin uh, gummies with me. Uh, a couple of uh, smokables, and uh, it, it's product I use daily. It's a, uh, you were just telling me you're using some from your skin on yeah, the, the salve. Having, right, exactly. Um, right, I got it right over here on my desk. And I'm waiting for my first uh, uh, bout of uh, eczema. I'll be using the salve. <laughs> Check out all their products. It's all third-party tested. Uh, a, a, a great company. Lots of integrity, both in the, the way that they uh, grow this stuff and what they do with uh, uh, with their revenue. Uh, SunsetLakeSebaDay.com. 30% off with the coupon code 420 for five more days. So uh, check it out. Also, uh, Mother's Day is coming up. You want to give your mom the best, including the best night's sleep. This Mother's Day, give her super soft, luxurious, designer preferred bedding from Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth is great. Uh, between the two of us, we've got sheets and du- duvet covers. Mm-hmm. Um, their best-selling bamboo sheet uh, set is made from 100% premium viscose from bamboo. The thing that's great about this stuff, not only is it soft, it is temperature regulating. It's good for the summer coming up. I like, am so excited. Especially psyched. if your apartment or house not that well insulated like mine, it's good to have. <laughs> they get uh, softer uh, with each wash. they the softest you will find. Uh, Cozy Earth even offers a 100-night sleep trial. You sleep on it, you wash it, you try it out. You can rinse and repeat, literally. Uh, and if you're not completely in love, just send it back for a full refund. Be sure to check out their uh, 10-year warranty as well. And it doesn't matter whether it's their luxury sheets, their loungewear, their pajamas, or their plush bath towels. Cozy Earth makes Mother's Day extra special. So now I have not only um, the the sheets... I've gotten a couple of uh, pieces of loungewear. My joggers, I took to uh, England. They uh, were fantastic just to kick around. Um, and I also got a couple of uh, towels and a bath mat uh, wow. from Cozy Earth. Yeah, I've gone all in. I've gone all in. Cozy Earth bedding comes in now five colors. Uh, and also they give you a, a beautiful like a reusable canvas bag. Check it out. Great for uh, Mother's Day. Also great for not Mother's Day. Huge Mother's Day sale going on now, though. Save up to 35% at Cozy Earth. Hurry. Mother's Day offers, uh, Mother's Day offers, and soon go to CozyEarth.com slash majority. Enter the code majority at checkout. Save up to 35%. That's CozyEarth.com slash majority. As always, we'll put the uh, links in the uh, podcast and YouTube description. Quick break. We'll be right back with uh, Professor John D. Erickson.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is a uh, pleasure to welcome to the program Professor John D. Erickson. He is a professor of sustainability science and policy at the University of Vermont, author of The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. Uh, professor, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Let's uh, let's start with just the um, the idea of well, I, I mean, just the, the the progress illusion, I guess. I mean, because one of the things that we've been trying to do at this uh, show for for quite some time is uh, to make people to understand that um, e economics is really it's just it, we're just making choices, um, and uh, 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 the, there is no necessarily no. Um, economics that exists outside of different people's ideas of what the economics should be of a place. Will you talk about that uh, progress illusion? Um, and I also, is it also an allusion to, uh, to Freud's future of an illusion? Because there seems to be sort of like, you know, a fairy tale quality that is being critiqued in both. Yeah. I mean, this book is a, is a reflection on the kind of economics that I was I grew up on the kind of economics that was taught, the kind of economics that is in, expressed in our policy and in our institutions. And it's a kind of economics that's highly individualistic, right? It's all about the person, about the individual. It's an economics built on a kind of morality of greed, right? You remember the Michael Douglas movie, uh, Wall Street in the 80s, greed is good, the Gordon Gecko character, right? It's a kind of economics that's also designed to make choices at the margin. Like we put a lot of emphasis in economics on marginal costs and marginal benefits, the next choice, right? If the next choice creates more benefits than costs, then you do it. It's like this rational actor model of economics. Yet we know that when all those small choices are added up together, they result in a future that we never would have voted for. We know that when you put all of choice on the back of the individual and kind of hope and pray that humans are rational creatures, we know that doesn't come true. These are kind of fairy tales that we perpetuate in our economics curr curriculum, in our business schools, in our political science programs. It's a kind of fairy tale that we have to upend and replace with an economics that, oh, maybe comes to terms with some biophysical realities of the planet comes to terms with who we are as humans, not this caricature of, of what we call in economics, believe it or not, homo economicus, this sort of subspecies of human. So the fairy tales are many and the progress illusion is about overturning them. Well, how would you, I mean, when, when you, when uh, are, are there, are there multiple, I mean, how ideological is, is this? I mean, as uh, how, uh, how much of our economics is a function of ideology and how much of it is uh, an, an ideology that is um, promulgated by people who are going to, who have set up a system so that, the, that, that there's an attempt to make it seem like it's a, just simply a rational or a pre-existing, uh, you know, an essential reality uh, versus one that is coincidentally uh, also going to put a certain class of people at, top, at the top. Yeah, I mean, economics is, is built on ideology. Any, any brand of economics is built on ideology. Uh, the question is, you know, who, what kind of economics is built for who and for what purpose? And this comes back to the sort of central notion of economic growth, the holy grail of gross domestic product. Yet we never ask growth for who, growth for what purpose, and growth for how long. The entire ideology, particularly of the mainstream, which is what I'm taking on in this book, the mainstream especially since reflected um, since the, what we call the neoliberal turn of the late 70s, early 80s, the mainstream ideology of economics is built to sort of support the notion of trickle down. It's built to support the notion of we don't have to ask, are there differences between necessities and luxuries? We don't ever have to ask about, you know, redistributing income or redistributing effort. We don't have to ask like, who owns the products of production and why it's all sort of taken as a given. And therefore this kind of market fundamentalism is taken as quote unquote natural instead of something that humans design with particular purpose and particular humans in mind. Um, let's just, let, let's start with talking about um, uh, uh, GDP 
Mm. Um, let, let's talk about how we calculate this, because I'm uh, uh, old enough to remember that in the wake of um, the fall of the Soviet Union, that there was a, there, there seemed to be a brief moment. I feel like it was in 90, I don't I, I, you know, 93, maybe mm -hmm. of of an idea of recalculating the GDP. Yeah. Uh, and then it just sort of went away. Um, but 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 tell us, how do we calculate the GDP? What is uh, problematic about it? So there's been many of these moments of rethinking GDP and redesigning GDP. It's become kind of the holy grail of progress in society. It's calculated as price times quantity. How much stuff do we make, right, times its price? And at, to some extent, your material well-being, right, how much a society consumes and produces is part of your progress, is part of your well-being, but only up to a point. And we also have to ask, what does it count and what does it miss? So, I mean, you can go back, for example, to Senator Robert Kennedy in 1968 had this famous speech about how GDP sort of counts nothing <laughs> that is most important to us as fathers, as mothers, as citizens, as communities. Um, it counts things like, you know, wildfires and the cost to rebuild communities and homes as a good thing. It counts oil spills as a good thing. It doesn't count things like unpaid care at home. It doesn't count trade-offs between our labor, leisure and our labor. Um, it misses so many things, yet is held up as the kind of um, the, the, the one true indicator of progress of a society. And when you go through the effort, as we have, have in the field of ecological economics, of teasing out what is a benefit in terms of what we spend money on and what is a cost, especially regrettable costs, teasing out the the distribution of the benefits and costs of a growing economy. We find when you do the math that the United States has been in a progress recession since the late 1970s. All right, let's uh, let's get a little more concrete with yeah. with that so that we can understand what 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 that means because I mean and, and like you say just another, you know, classic example that uh, that I've always understood is that you know, if I get robbed, somebody busts my door down in my house yep. and they steal all my stuff, um that's going to benefit the GDP. Great for um, the economy. <laughs> it's great because I got to go back out. I got to buy all this stuff again. I got to hire somebody to repair mm -hmm. my door. But the cost to me in terms of my time, the cost for me in terms of my sense of security, the cost for me in terms of like, you know, uh, the, the, the sense of like, oh, I, you know, that was a family heirloom. None yeah. of that is regarded whatsoever. My, right. my, my overall happiness whether this, you know, in the time I got to take off of work, and so I don't, uh, you know, whatever, I, I miss the big meeting and I don't have the chance to do the proposal. None of that is, is, is accounted for in this. So what is, what, when you say that we're in a progress recession, what, what does that mean? Like what constitutes progress in your, uh, uh, you know, I guess, sure, sure. Uh, a type of economics? Yeah. So, I mean, how does the economy contribute to our well-being? Right. So, of course, consumption contributes to our well-being. Right. Um, we want to be able to afford the necessities of life. We want to be able to afford a roof over our head and food on the table and our kids to have good health care and, and, and uh, a good life. But um, so much of what we spend money on, your example of getting robbed, is a regrettable expense. Right. To rebuild homes after disaster is a regrettable expense. Um, to, to spend money on health care um, as a sort of defense to having chemicals in our food system <laughs> is a regrettable expense. So we should really understand not just the quantity of the economy, which is what GDP is great at calculating, but the quality of that economy. We should be able to answer the question, that next unit of growth, which is where economists love to live at the next unit, did it create more benefits than costs? And if it didn't, and we're not counting the costs, we're only counting the benefits, then maybe we've entered an era of what my colleague and mentor Herman Daly called uneconomic growth, right? Where each new unit of growth is creating more costs than benefits. Why would any sane society continue to sort of expand an economy in a way that creates more costs than benefits? Because... <laughs> 
The benefits are concentrated into the hands of the few and the costs are spread on everyone else, including future generations. GDP has done that really well. Other metrics have started to point to the loss of quality of life, the loss of well-being. I mean, what are we celebrating? We're the biggest economy in the world, but we have the highest poverty rate amongst rich countries. We have one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Um, our, our children are now dying more from guns than anything else. All of those things are great for a growing, expanding economy, but are they good for our well-being? Are they good for peace and prosperity? Is there uh, the relationship between like an expanding economy? I mean, is there a way, how would you recalculate this? In other words, sure. um, if we're looking at like a situation where, um, uh, let's say a company like, like DuPont, uh, they, they're, they're pouring their C8 into the water. So, I mean, this is a, this was a, you know, a case that was, that was, uh, that uh, widely known they're pouring their, uh, chemical into the waters instead of like burning it like they're supposed to. Um, they're making more money. Yeah. Their, you know, their, their revenue is up. Uh, their shareholders get more money. They go out and spend more stuff. But of course, other people are uh, dying of cancer um, and that begins, but they've got to spend money on the cancer treatment. Um, they've got to uh, maybe hire somebody to help them, you know, uh, w w deal with their uh, their sickness, et cetera, et cetera. GDP just keeps going up because of all of those those things. Right. Um, but how would what costs would you and how would you like how would you re-calculate uh, um, uh, that real-world equation into an economic equation? Sure, sure. So the, the Biden administration is going down this path, actually. Um, they have this, this cross-government approach where they're trying to understand the, the very dependence on the health of, of an economy on the health of the environment, right? So to really start to elucidate some of those, exactly some of those trade-offs, because right now, the expansion of an economy or a business enterprise or the creation of a product, all those benefits are easy to count. What did it sell for? How many jobs did it create? What was what, what taxes were paid? But the costs, right, the depletion of the environment, the pollution of the environment, those are all either ignored, right, or the insanity of it is, is that when we deplete our soils, when we pollute our waters, when we spew pollutants into the atmosphere, those are largely ignored. Um, this this comes down to a kind of economics that really should be more thoughtful about the balance between private benefits and costs and public benefits and costs. And all of this is by design. Um, under the kind of Reagan revolution, right, there was this executive order passed, uh, executive order 12291, that mandated, right, that we do economic cost-benefit analysis on all public policy. The implication of that is it's really easy to count the benefits of a growing economy and very difficult to count the costs. And so that therefore ushered in a whole system, a whole ideology that says privatize everything. Mm. Everything that matters is what's measured in the marketplace. And if we can't measure it in the marketplace, then it doesn't matter. So is that yeah. kind? Of, yeah, would you ca Please. call that the financialization of growth? Yeah. I mean, I, that's that's where I feel like we're kind of zeroing in on is growth in sectors that benefit people more broadly and are not concentrated at the top. It is not incentivized in the same way that financialized growth is, which is. Uh, built on the myth of endless growth under capitalism that really only b benefits the people at the top who are hoarding the wealth that comes from any growth in that area. Thank you for that. Yeah, all, all economics and all economies are an expression of a society's values. And in doing research for this book, I dug up an old qu quote from Margaret Thatcher, who said, economics are the method. The object is to change the heart and soul, right? So when we think to the kind of economics that I was indoctrinated in through the 80s and 90s, the kind of economics that we teach our young people today is meant to change the heart and soul, is meant to educate consumers, right? Not citizens. Is meant to sort of financial, your, your, your thing about financialization, right? 
is meant to say all things of value are in dollar terms. And if it's not in dollar terms, then it doesn't count. Yet I remind my students, we wrote the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, the Civil Rights Act, right? All, all of these kind of progressive hallmarks of the U.S. legal system didn't have an economic cost calculus built into them. We did those things because they were morally right to do. We did those things based on science-informed democracy. We did those things because the economy is meant to be our servant, not our master. We have flipped everything around in the last few decades. And so is the, is the fix a, a, a way, is it about recalculating so that we have like, you know, both, let's say, you know, uh, that we're, we're, we're actually sure. accounting for all economic account, uh, you know, activity and maybe even putting a number to like, Hey, when, you know, Sam has to spend two hours, um, uh, you know, or 10 hours or, or 50 hours trying to get his door fixed and his, yeah, yeah. you know, the his TV back and his computer and he lost all those photos. We're going to put a number on that. And that's going to, uh, uh, you know, we're going to put that on the cost side of the ledger uh, and put it against the sort of like uh, whatever the, re the the economic activity, uh, you know, yep. the revenue generating side for other people. And that's going to balance it out. I mean, is that the answer? I think it's part of the answer. I think it's a transition strategy of kind of if you play by the current rules of the game, you're going to have to put a dollar value on things, right? So we've done this in Vermont. We've passed into law a genuine progress indicator where we go through and systematically take the GDP accounts for Vermont and walk through it and say, this is a benefit. This is a cost, a regrettable expense. These are things like the value of household work that aren't counted. Here's the adjustment for income distribution and wealth distribution, right? And we go through and meticulously, like a national income accountant would do, make those changes for this one metric of how Vermont asked the question, how well are we doing? Speaking of how well we're doing, my lights went off, see, because we're trying to we're trying to save energy here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that, I think that's one way to do it. But we also have to recognize that not not all values, not all decisions should be weighted by cost benefit calculus, right? That part of this um, reorientation of an economics that's fair and just and sustainable is about starting to reprioritize our values, right? Make the economy work for us, not the other way around. Uh, there's been so many warnings through the years. Uh, Carl Polanyi in the 1950s wrote this book called The Great Transformation. And he worried about the coming market society, right? Where the society is run by the rules designed and written by economists. And I fear that's what's happening, right? Instead of sort of debating and creating a democracy that frames and and controls an economic system versus the other way around. Well, well so where do where, where, I, I'm struck by like the sort of the the absence of like a, a, a of of just even uh, mentioning capitalism. Mm. Like I mean, our in, 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 and so what is the 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 solution here? I mean, uh, when we talk about like you know um, our, our values, like I mean, frankly, I'm not sure. I don't know where we would land on our values necessarily in the context of, of our country, uh, you know, these days. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what, why no mention of capitalism and why, like, where, where are we headed with the, 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 sure. the critique that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, ca capitalism is, is the, the, uh, the elephant in the room, right? Cap a capitalism system is one where the market decides on how to allocate resources and the resources are owned by cap capitalists, right? By individuals. And so what we've done is we've built an economic system that forsakes all other values and other choices and just fits them into the mold of economic choice and market choice and market fundamentalism. Um, all of the kind of adjustments through the years of economics that have tried to bring economics back into balance with other values of society, I mean, Keynes did this in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and he called it wisely managed capitalism, right? Where you really have government institutions <laughs> that supersede the capitalism framework, right? Um, the environmental movement was all about kind of reining in the, all of these 
feedback systems in the capitalistic model where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, where capital is has all of these costs that aren't accounted for. So uh, whether it's you want to call it democratic socialism or wisely managed capitalism or a new system of governance that is more bottom up than top down, this ultimately comes back to your original point of, is about taking power back, right? Is about who manages the economy and for what purpose? Who does the economy benefit and for how long? So, what is the uh, the the goal? Is this a is this a uh, is this ultimately a degrowth argument, or is this a reorient um, the way? I mean, frankly, in a more efficient way, our our resources. I mean, we we produce as a as a as a world, you know, something like twenty five percent more food than we need. It just doesn't go to the right places, and a lot of it's wasted. We have, um, we have the we we like you say, we're the wealthiest nation on earth in the history of Earth. Uh, yet we have uh, uh, all sorts of extreme poverty. We have homelessness. We have things that don't exist in countries that are ostensibly less wealthy than us, right. and that is really ultimately a function of of redistribution isn't it it is but it's also pre-distribution right it's how do we design the system uh to begin with and, and that's what this is about um the current economic system and the current economics that we teach was built for a different time and for a different purpose right it was it was built in that kind of early stage capitalism where growth was the mandate right i mean all of the kind of macroeconomics that we teach was born out of the necessity of the great depression to get people back to work and it was quantity, 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 and and don't worry about anything else until we, until we grow the economy. Um, 21st century is different. There's way more people, right? There's much of a bigger bigger environmental problem. There's the climate crisis. Crisis. There's biodiversity loss. There's growing inequality, right? We have to step back and say, this economics that we teach, we call it neoclassical economics that was crafted in the late 1800s. <laughs> Is it fit for mission, right? Is it the kind of economics that fits the kinds of problems that we have today? Mm -hmm. So this is a real re, about the book is about a reprioritization of our goals of the economy. But, First but, and foremost, but, it's oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I thought I did not mean to cut you off. Yeah, go do ahead. one, two, three real quick. First, yeah. first is, is we should be teaching our economics that ask the question, how big should the economy be? Right. So this is your point, Sam, about uh, degrowth, right? If we've grown an economy that's especially in Western countries that are creating more costs and benefits, what are we doing? <laughs> right? So the scale of the economy is an important question for the 21st century that was ignored in the 1800s. Once we sort of figure out what the right size of the economy should be, we've built an economic system that fails unless it's growing. So we therefore have to really rethink that as well. Who gets the benefits and who gets the costs of a right sized economy? then we can come back to the economist's specialty of efficiency, right? That we want to create a system that is efficient and well-run and well-tuned. Economists are well-equipped to be folks that were trained like me, to be the janitors of the market, to be the plumbers of the market, to be the mechanics of the market. But we weren't trained to be the sort of social planners of everything, to be the lords of society. And I'm afraid that's, that's where we've positioned ourselves. But I guess where I get confused is when you talk about like the scale of the economy or you talk yeah. about growth or not growth, these are fictionalized concepts anyways, right? I mean, like we have decided, you know, like if, if I want to measure, have I grown is my son, my, has my son who's, who's 10, has he grown right. in the, uh, in the past three years, the, the measure I can choose uh, to measure whether he's grown is I can take a, a ruler and I can see how tall he is. Yep. The other yep. way I could do that is just by mass or I could do it by, you know, how thick he is, or I could just look at his hair and decide that's how I'm going to decide his growth. Right. Or I can say like, is he more mature? Uh, how, how sophisticated is his language become? There's, we, we have a situation. It seems to me that the, that you're, you're laying out that we've chosen one measure of, of assessing growth that uh, ostensibly is considered beneficial. And perhaps at one time it was, but it is no longer beneficial to society to measure growth in that manner. 
And so is the question really that whether we're looking for growth or not growth, or rather, are we looking for um, the idea of like, just simply a different measurement, which will then implicate the values that we have chosen to assess there. So like, you know, if I decide that I want, I'm going to measure growth by height because we live in a society where everything is at a a certain shelf level. And you know, that's the most important thing. uh, Then that's the way I'll do it. But if it really is more about, you know, how much hair you have or whatever it is, then, then we do it another way. Like, like I get confused between, the 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 concept that we have chosen a measure of growth that is really only that is is sort of a fraudulent sales pitch for benefits for a specific set of people in the in in, in our society yeah. versus the idea of like growth is bad well look so so back to we don't ask the question when we do our books as a nation We don't ask the question, growth for who, growth for what purpose, and growth for how long. So take your son, right? (laughs) Is he going to grow forever, right? Is, 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 does he get all the growth and none of your other kids can grow, right? Like growth is a physical concept. And to imagine that we can infinitely grow a person, a house, a nation, a globe, infinitely in a finite planet is, Fairy tale thinking. Why do we continue to sort of teach that fairy tale? Because we only count the benefits and ignore the costs. Because we only care about who the benefits go to in terms of the the folks who own the capital and get to make the decisions over the system, right? And we ignore the the democracy that's behind the scenes that's been deprioritized. Growth is a physical concept. It has trade-offs. We don't teach that in economics. We don't teach that a global national economy has trade-offs in the social costs of growth and the ecological costs of growth. Emma, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I'm just I'm I'm energized by the discussion because I, I I felt like you know earlier we did establish how so much of growth though is kind of bullshit for for lack of a better word. It's based on financialization for who and for what purpose that's the question right? right but but then that's not physical in any real way right that's just wealth hoarding and so then i think it comes back to a question of wealth re- redistribution the the leftist and socialist concern about degrowth is that we uh, when we don't come at it from a ca- anti-capitalist perspective the mm-hmm. the brunt of degrowth is going to be felt by people at the bottom and I mean, I, I, I th- that's, I guess, kind of what I, I'd love to get your thoughts on. Right. No, if you don't if you don't take on who, who owns capital and, and, and how, if you don't take on more cooperative arrangements or building a care economy or recognizing all of the other work that happens to build a well-being in society. And if you just take take the current system and degrow, then the most vulnerable inside you're going to get hurt. So the, the question is around transition. How do we orchestrate a just transition to a right-sized economy? How do we create a more nimble, smaller economy that doesn't fundamentally depend on growth? Because folks like me who are doing the math on the ecological side of things around climate change and soil loss and water pollution and, and the very air that we breathe are sort of recognizing that the system is going to be downsized either by disaster or by design. So the kind of economics that we would like to build in this century is an economics that downsizes and right sizes the economic system by design that does it that that centers justice that centers equity that asks the kinds of questions you're asking around financialization Mm. because yeah financialization makes all this kind of money for money and money from nothing but all that money all that spending power has an ecological expression right it results in airplanes and flights and spending. And, and then you, you measure that, the spending that we do as a society against well-being metrics, against surveys like the Gallup poll or surveys on life satisfaction or surveys on well-being. And we recognize that we're growing like crazy and well-being has been flat or in decline, right? Or that we're growing, the United States is growing in a certain style that's very privatized and very lopsided. 
And our metrics on poverty and on mental health and on obesity don't measure up to other kinds of, of models uh, across the ocean. I feel like uh, we're, we may need another uh, another hour to get to this, but but I guess like you, the thing that I'm getting hooked, uh, you know, uh, caught up on is is yeah. the, sort of the same sort of a point I think that Emma is making is that if growth is just a concept, like I mean, it, it, like for instance, okay, you mentioned airplanes, right? We're flying all over the place. Well, what if we decided as a society in or in this country that yeah. um, we're going to uh, um, heavily regulate airplanes? Uh, there's only going to be uh, flights. You, there are no more hour-long flights in this country. Uh, there are only going to be, let's say, um, you know, three-hour flights. And mm -hmm. what we're going to do is we're going to build high-speed rail, and we're going to build, um, you know, more uh, uh, more public transportation, and we're going to go back to really the sort of like the 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 railway system we had 150 years ago or 100 years ago in this country. Um, and we're going to uh, develop technologies. Um, I, you know, I, I'm just uh, throwing it out there, but uh, let's say, you know, uh, nuclear power that is going to provide electricity for these things. Um, I have some issues with, with nuclear power, but I'm just using this as, as an example. Um, and as a society, we're going to essentially, you know, flatten things. Uh -huh. Airlines, only very limited use more public transportation that's going to theoretically grow the economy right i mean we're going to see like this this huge industry uh and we're going to employ a lot more people uh on these railway lines and we're going to have a lot more uh, activity because people are going to be able to travel more uh and it's going to be uh the the travel is going to be open to a, a broader swath of people what what what's did, is that what you're talking about, or is that problematic in, no, in the perspective? You're giving examples of, of striking a new kind of balance. You're giving examples of growing certain activities and degrowing other activities, right? You're giving an example of, of providing people with more choice, for example, with transportation, not less. You're giving an example. I mean, if we're imagining a society that's fit for purpose and a society that's fit with what the planet can support, we're probably looking at a decentralization of, of power and production, right? We're looking at a relocalization of economic of, of economic systems. We're looking at systems that are still interconnected through trade, right? But not trade for for plastic choice from toys from China. Trade for things that actually improve people's lives. Um, we're looking at a kind of creating a well-being economy, right? A well-being economy that prioritizes sufficiency, that prioritizes, you know, take the sustainable development goals, you know, that nearly all the world's countries have agreed upon, right? That prioritizes a good life that is fits within the means of the planet, right? This is the question to ask in 2023, not in 1823. The question to ask is, how do we create a good life within our means? Um, and that's the kind of economics that we're trying to create and and uh, and build um, an, an economics that's based in biophysical reality, uh, an economics that um, centers social equity and justice, an economics that just doesn't just like a, a roll of the dice and you know hey whoever whoever wins with the most stuff dies the happiness the happiest, which just ain't true right? You look at all the social ecological research right. Um, the bloated economies like the United States aren't taking care of, of our own people, of our own citizens. Yet we're still on this kind of treadmill and we're all stuck in these rat races. And we're, we're sort of running around and around and around the hamster wheels saying growth will solve the problems that growth creates. What happens now? What do we do next? Don't worry. Growth will solve the problems that growth creates. Right. Instead of asking the questions around redistribution, instead of asking the questions about ownership, Instead of asking the questions about public finance versus private financialization, right? All of these questions are the context of a new economics and a new economy. John Sorry, D. Erickson. You got, up, you got me up on my uh, soapbox here. No, well, that's, that's what we brought you here for. John D. Erickson, professor of sustainability, science and policy at the University of Vermont, author of The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. Thanks so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Awesome. Thank you.
Thanks so much. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to Justin uh, Allo and to um, Matt uh, Leichinger. And they are uh, both Teamsters, uh, two different locals. We'll be right back in just a moment. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Um, joining us now, Justin Allo, Teamsters Local 542 in San Diego, and Matt Leidinger. He is of uh, the Teamsters Local 804 in New York. 
Um, they are both members of TDU. We will ask you what that means. In the meantime, Bradley's going to make you a little bit bigger uh, on the, <laughs> the screen. We are um, uh, our regular tech guy. Matt has been in grand jury uh, duty for an extended period of time. We'll allow the uh, don't worry about that. OK, thank you, Matt. Um, and so uh, uh, Matt, uh, so Bradley will be just growing these guys a little bit as they go. But um, let's just start with uh, wh what is TDU? Because part of uh, of what this um, this camp the this strike ultimately could be about is uh, two classifications that were developed after the '97 strike uh, against uh, UPS. So uh, Matt, why don't you start and tell us uh, about uh, what TDU is and also th those uh, two different classifications that exist. Yeah, sure. Um, so TDU stands for Teamsters for a Democratic Union, which is a rank and file caucus within the Teamsters Union, which actually emerged in the 1970s, um, essentially as an effort to fight against corruption that had existed in the union um, for a little bit of time. And it has continued um, as a powerful force in the union um, in terms of activating like rank and file members and maintaining a sense of uh, rank and file leadership and organization within the union. And so uh, the, the two classifications that you were referring to earlier, the 22-4 position uh, which was actually created in the 2018 contract, this, oh, okay. this last Sorry. contract that we're currently under. Um, and what that position is, is the language, which is very kind of like vague, um, established this combination driver position that technically is supposed to work like half time inside the building as like a warehouse worker and then half time as a driver, as a way to like take overtime away from regular package car drivers. But in reality, what happened was these 22-4s, Justin and I are both 22-4s, were just used in the same exact way in most of the country as regular package car drivers, except our wages are lower than regular package car drivers. And we have less protections against things like excessive overtime. Um, and we can't have like request loads for like an eight hour day. So it's essentially just like a cheaper and more flexible driver. And the sad thing is that this position was undemocratically forced upon the union by the old Hoffa regime. And so it's one of the issues that has emerged as a strike issue this uh, time around, but also it's one of the issues that Sean O'Brien and the Teamsters United Slate, which was endorsed by Teamsters for a Democratic Union, um, it's one of the issues eliminating this two-tier driver position uh, that Teamsters United campaigned on um a couple years ago when they were running for office interesting and justin um i i know you you wrote a piece about um uh strike force and uh you know talking to i guess a member uh, a, a a fellow member who was involved in that 97 strike tell us about that story and what the implications are now because it's obviously like we're dealing with a different teamsters uh today than we did just even 10 years ago all right um Tim Peppers is a 97 striker and he has his fellow co-workers, Jim, uh, Jason Mendez. He came to me with a vision and he wanted to connect that bridge from the cross generations of the 97 and the 224. And there's the gap between us that separates us. And that's what we're essentially trying to do. And so we formed a group called Strike Force. Every Friday we have unity breakfast, 7 to 8 a.m. And it's been an awesome way to collab the younger generation and the older generation under one umbrella and just trying to inform uh, what's coming up. And the main objective is to the contract. Um, so it's just ranking file members there. There's no one on the executive board. It's just, you know, a rank and file grass, grass movement. And yeah. And Matt, um, the, give, give us a sense of like, you know, with this change in the union, is there a, um, a, is there like how would you characterize it broadly speaking? I mean, I know that um, uh, Sean O'Brien has basically said, and 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 we'll get to like why we're talking to you on today. It's a specific uh, deadline date, and and what's going to happen in the future. But uh, the Teamsters uh, General President Sean O'Brien, uh, you mentioned earlier, 
has said that this strike could end up being like a much bigger than the union itself. Like what, what, what has changed sort of almost ideologically or in terms of the approach of, of not just the union, but unionism broadly with this new regime? Yeah. Uh, well, let me give a little context because so Sean O'Brien was actually on the bargaining committee in 2018 initially with the Hoffa leadership, but he was actually fired off of the bargaining committee because he wanted to take a very militant approach. So Hoffa actually fired him. Um, and I, I think that what O'Brien's campaign and ultimately like what his leadership is really pushing for now is uh, a shift that's taking place, I think, more broadly in the labor movement where workers are fed up and want to go on the offensive. Hoffa's leadership, I think, was very okay, kind of just playing on the defensive, giving concessions as long as his kind of like as long as he could remain in office and keep his job. Um, but we're seeing not only in the Teamsters with like the election of O'Brien and this leadership, which is um, representative of a rank and file who wants to fight. Um, mm. We were delivering packages, delivering vaccines during the pandemic, right? Justin and I were both doing this, you know, as were 350,000 other Teamsters. And during this time period, you know, like we were risking our safety while a lot of other people were just ordering things from home. And at the same time, inflation as we've seen in the last five years, has increased at a rate that is higher than we've gotten raises. Um, and so we've actually seen like a, a decline in our purchasing power as workers at the same time that our conditions have gotten worse. Meanwhile, a company like UPS has seen historic profits, $13.9 billion alone in the last year. And so there clearly is money to go around. It's just the workers at UPS have seen a decline in working conditions, decline in purchasing power, whereas UPS is selling out billions and billions of dollars in stock buyback and dividends to shareholders. And so what O'Brien's leadership is really representing and showing not only to Teamsters, but to workers across the whole country and you know hopefully the whole world is that we are just not okay with this wealth inequality anymore. We're not okay with these companies taking money off the backs of our hard labor, especially coming out of the pandemic. And I think the movement that we're seeing in UAW as well, um, with the election of Sean Fain, yeah. which was supported by UAWD, which is uh, a reform caucus that has, I think, learned a lot from TDU, um, we're seeing these reform movements emerge in other uh, large unions like UAW. Um, I believe there's a reform movement kind of emerging in UFCW as well. So uh, in this time of intense wealth inequality, I think workers are just fed up and ready to take back what we deserve. Justin, give us a sense of uh, of the working conditions and 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 what people um, uh, are making, and just uh, your experience as a driver, um, and and I guess ostensibly also a guy who's supposed to be in the warehouse too, but really more on the uh, driving. Dating back to 2020 or just currently? Just I mean, uh, w whatever you know strikes you. I mean, obviously this is these are these are long standing issues that you guys have had, and and just overall uh, what your 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 perspective and your experience has been? Yeah, I think it's crucial to go back into 2020 during the pandemic. Again, people were working from home and the economy shut down while we re we came into work. You know, we made the economy run. Um, I believe that, I don't believe, I know I showed up and they, I felt, took a delay in making the pandemic a priority for the workers. Like the, the, the blocks, of it, you know, the masks, the gloves, everything in the bathroom sort of say it, it didn't take place till later in the year. So we showed up risking our lives, you know, and the volume just increased and they increased our um, 70 hour work weeks, you know, instead of, so we didn't get any compensation for hazard pay, anything like that. When we, when we had our, when we finished our eight, 10, 10, 12 hour days, they made us come back to the yard and there was loads of volume in the yard that we had to go back and fill our trucks, trucks back up with to go back out. And, you know, we, we were done our, you know, and, Again, 
family members were passing away, but they still asked us to show up to work, you know? And it, it just was a crazy time that we won't forget. And we hope the company doesn't forget that as well. Um, and even now the two tier, I think it's best described in a, in a podcast um, through, through Teddy Ostro on the upsurge. He explains the two tier and uh, a two tier is a cancer, not just to the teamster union, but to all unions. And so, well, ex- ex- explain that because once you open up the door to sort of like uh, multiple classifications, that's always going to be a way that uh, the, right. that that management always tries to sort of reclassify specific, uh, you know, more and more workers into that less paying, uh, less paid, worse conditions uh, tier. Correct. Yeah, we do the same work for unequal pay. You know, Matt touched on it that we have less protection we don't have any protection you know that's a one of the hardest things they can work us out to however long they want to and you know at night you know so we don't have any nine to five rights we don't have any eight hour requests um again we're just cheaper labor for the company and that's essentially why we want to make this 224 language be abolished you know and so matt uh today was a deadline uh, that was set by the union pr- uh, many months ago, if, as far as I can tell, um, to deal with the the supplemental and the local contracts. What what are those? And uh, and then let's talk about where we're headed over the next May June three months, I guess. Yeah. So so each con. I mean, the Teamster contract. There's a national master agreement which covers every worker in the bargaining unit. So like Justin and I are covered by the same national master agreement. And this covers basic things like wages. Those are like across the board. And then uh, there are like regional and local supplements, which are like attached to each national master agreement at the end. Um, So like I have a a local 804 supplement, and this has to do with just more specific kind of language like uh, holidays, vacations, stuff like that. Anyways, this time around, uh, O'Brien decided to have the supplements negotiated before the national master agreement. Uh, And there was supposed to be like we were supposed to begin negotiations of the national master agreement, um, I I believe today. Uh, But what what's happened is that the company was dragging its feet through the supplemental negotiations. I, I wasn't on the negotiating committee, but I was hearing from our leadership and from the negotiating committee that they would not even show up to bargaining. They would just come out with ridiculous proposals, trying to take more and more from us. Meanwhile, we're at the bargaining table trying to just catch up to, you know, inflation and get things like Martin Luther King day as a paid holiday. UPS said, what does that do for us? Uh, and right. so O'Brien said, look, if you're not going to, if you're not going to come to the table and negotiate in good faith, we're not even going to start the national negotiations until you get those supplements settled. And this is significant because he has also said that we're not going to extend the deadline of the contract, which means July 31st is a hard deadline. In 2018, from what I've heard, they began negotiations in 2017 and they extended the contract and ratified the agreement in 2019. So the window now is so short that it it's turning up the heat a lot and i think we're gonna see i think as a result the likelihood of a strike is much higher because ups has was dealing with hafa and that regime and negotiations for a long time which was buddy buddy with the company and i think now there's a fire that's getting lit under them no more management unionism at this point and uh, and and we should say obviously uh, anybody involved in negotiations knows like from 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 UPS's perspective, they don't want to lock in any gains on the supplemental or the local before they have to go with the big the other big negotiations. The more that they can keep alive in there, the more areas they have in which to chip away, uh, and and so that that strategy is pretty clear. So where so I mean I, I mean I think you just said it, Matt. The likelihood of a strike is is pretty high. Justin, give me a sense of like what you guys are doing. I mean, part of like the strike force is is part of this, right? You're meeting, you're having breakfast, you're bringing food to people uh, who are working the later shifts. You're starting to build solidarity now, and I assume you've been doing this for months, if not years, uh, so that 
when it comes time to getting on the picket line and things start getting hard at one point, your level of determination and resilience is greater than the company's. Oh yeah, the determination is definitely there. That's what our group has kind of helped build. Again, uh, we the members that came together, we had ideas. We've made brochures, you know, uh, just for our rank and file members to every Friday for questions, you know, anything to help inform and keep them involved for what's coming up. You know, Matt out of 804 is a strong local. So that was an inspiration. You know, I've been kind of studying what they've been doing up there and hopefully bringing that inspiration down here to our members and, and our local. And it's been growing every week. You know, first meeting we thought was only going to be five, seven. It was 15 almost. The next meeting, they grew to 25, then to 35. And then by the fifth meeting, we had 45 members there. Um, last week, we had the feeder crew come in. Feeder is our truck to, dra- truck to trailer. They came in because they heard about what's going on. So it's kind of a buzz that's going around, but they love it. And uh, there, there's no, you know, anything political going on. It, the main focus on it is the contract. And that's where me and Matt have been working, you know, partnering up. And we've been networking with other Teamsters to bring in any information to help build the momentum going forward and help our president at the table. And I mean, last this past weekend, I went to the rally in Southern California, I mean, in, in Orange County. So the energy was epic. Um, I think it was definitely something that we needed and for our members to come up from San Diego to see the vibe and energy. And we got to witness Sean O'Brien speak to the members. And we had members from local 396, local 952, local 63. Um, and it was a mixture of all Teamsters. And it was just a, a, a great atmosphere uh, for what we're going to witness. And this is only, what, in May, April? I, I hope it can, it's going to continue. It's only going to get bigger going forward. So. So do you guys have like a, I don't know, like a discord or something like that? Like if, if there are, if there are members of other locals around the country, how many locals are there? And, 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 uh, and if there are members uh, of other locals who want to like get into conversations with you guys and other locals, find out like what best practices are or ideas, uh, you know, organizing, uh, what, what, how, how do they do that? I mean, it already started. Uh, me and Matt, he's all the way in New York. I'm in Southern California. He's actually, uh, I met one of his his boys, uh, Teddy Ostro. Again, he's the, the host of the Upsurge, the, up, uh, the podcast. Um, myself and Matt are on there as well. We have another Teamster out of Georgia, David uh, Allen. Out of, he does the Roswell Channel. It's educational content for all Teamsters. So we've been, Teamsters are now starting to utilize social platforms, and we're starting to network, share, subscribe those channels to each members and we're starting to all come together slowly, but surely. And, and is there, do you have like a, like a, I don't know, like a, like a, some type of forum where people can go and talk or is it just, uh, you're, you're disseminating through like podcasts? I mean, it's word through mouth and group texts, you know, the, the guys you hang out with at work, you know, Matt can, you know, they have a different, everyone has their own culture and their local. You right. know, and like I said, I'm learning through Matt about how they do things in 804. And we've done things kind of organically down here in San Marcos. Um, again, we've been, you know, the guys you hang out with, the group of four or five starting a group text. There's about 11 of us in there. So any video that comes out, we're sharing it. And next, you know, every Friday, well, when it comes to Friday, we talk about those videos that we share. And then we're just utilizing every platform right now and every just to be informed and involved. But go ahead, Matt. If you- yeah, I, uh, there's also I mean, there's also things that the the IBT and also TDU are doing to, um, you know, like reach members across the whole country. I mean, for one, uh, O'Brien has really done, uh, I think, a pretty incredible job of going to UPS facilities. I mean, not just UPS facilities, but he is he's reaching members all over the country. I don't know when he sleeps. He's going to UPS hubs, talking to the members. Uh, we have uh, a UPS Teamsters United or UPS Teamsters app that does weekly updates about the contract, events that are going on. Um, and so we're definitely pushing members across the country to download that app. TDU has been hosting national Zoom calls um, that discuss a lot of you know basic sort of like economic education about why UPS has enough money um, to, to pay us. Even though like when we're on the shop floor, the company's saying, oh, look, we're running out of volume. The competition's too intense. So it's a combination, I think, of IBT platforms, TDU platforms, and then also 
locally members take th- take matters into their own hands and and start doing organizing that way as well. All right, one last question for you, Matt. Um, I guess it's sort of a two parter. What can um, people who are not in the union do to help support you guys? And sort of like I guess as a subset, when you walk into you're delivering to, I don't know, you're delivering to fast food restaurants, you're delivering to like other businesses. Do you are like, are, are there union people there from a completely different union who are going like, like how much of, how much of, of the sort of, I guess, trans union conversations are happening at this point? Um, and what is the opportunity for sort of like support, uh, existing across different unions and, and what can folks like us do if we're, I, whether we're in, uh, uh, another union or, uh, we're not in a union, what can we do to support? Totally. Well, I'll give one example of something that's happening here in New York, which I think is really exciting. Um, that can maybe be a model for people elsewhere, but, um, uh, an organization called DSA democratic socialists of America, both in New York and nationally, is playing a very crucial role in doing solidarity for uh, Teamsters at this time. And so in New York, we have um, a citywide campaign called the Union Power Campaign. And one of the parts of this campaign is um, one of the subcommittees is the Labor Solidarity Committee. And so, for example, you know, we have a rally coming up on April uh, 21st, this Friday. And so one thing that New York City DSA is doing is something as simple as just coordinating, um, you know, bringing coffee to that rally, showing up, showing public support. Uh, At the same time, uh, Jamal Bowman is going to be speaking at this rally and he's um, a DSA elected. So uh, DSA is throwing down really hard with the funds that the organization has to do things as simple as show up in numbers, bring coffee. You know, I'm sure if we go on strike, they'll be bringing pizzas and this isn't something that a political organization alone has to do. This is something that church groups can do. This is something that any type of group or organization uh, can do. They can reach out to, um, you know, everyone might know a Teamster. Teamsters are all across the country. So just find a way to get in touch with someone in a local Teamsters union and think about people in your community um, who might be able to just pitch some money and to do something as simple as, buying some coffee for a rally. Um, And there's definitely going to be cross-union support. I know in 97, Verizon showed up um, to the picket lines that I, you know, in, we have the joint councils, which are like the groups of uh, broader Teamster locals within the each like region or city. So there's going to be a lot of uh, cross-union support for sure. Um, But I think that example of the DSA union power campaign is um, significant, at least in our local context. Great. Well, uh, Justin Allo and Matt Leitchinger, uh, we will be, I think, in touch with you over the next uh, couple of months uh, as that date arrives. And um, I think, you know, it really does look like you guys are going on strike. And so um, uh, it's good to see you guys out and like, you know, gearing up for this, uh, because that's the I think the best way uh, that you guys are going to have success is that when the when that company feels the pressure and because they're going to do everything they can to make you guys look like the bad guys in this situation uh it's good that you guys are getting out there thanks so much for coming on and we'll put links uh to all the things you had talked about in the uh, podcast and youtube descriptions thanks so much for having us yeah thank you thanks guys all right folks we're going to take a uh, quick break head into the um uh fun half of the program where we'll make fun of uh, some people and um and uh and have some fun we'll take your phone calls we'll um t- <laughs> we'll take you uh we'll, we'll take your phone calls we'll read some ims hey couple things um the we we still have some of the limited run of the um the effing dork shirts yep at shop.majorityreportradio.com. You can you get the effing or the uh, oh, yeah, the, uh, the, wow. uh, the full effing. I didn't even notice that. Mm-hmm. We have got that. the safe for work Not and the who cares what you fellow workers feel like <laughs> shirt. Um, 
Uh, you get those, show some uh, pride in being an effing dork. Uh, it's better than being an effing loser. That's what oh, I yeah. say. Um, also, uh, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. I always remember those guys from bringing out coffee in Madison when people were striking. And, you know, it really, it, it may seem like a really small thing, but so much of the, the solidarity that's built on these picket lines is a function of, you know, just what, what, what is your impression of how this is going? And, mm -hmm. you know, when people come and give you free coffee, or they bring you pizzas, it just gives you a sense that there's, there's support. It just, it buoys your spirits. So uh, folks should start getting ready for this because this is going to be a big, big deal. Um, something like, what is it? 280,000, 340,000, I think it is, Teamsters uh, uh, um, across the country. Um, so this is going to be a big deal, the strike, and it's going to happen uh, end of July, well, I, I think, at this point. Yeah. Uh, so don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And don't forget the AM Quickie. Want to get um, uh, top stories of the day? We got uh, Corey and Bob working um, the big time on this. Bob's Bob doing great. Our, yeah, Bob wrote our issue this morning. He's he's doing a great job. We're, yep. we're loving his insights. I and, love that AM quickie. And as the union stuff gets more important, Bob does a lot of uh, um, uh, yeah. work in terms of labor and whatnot. So uh, check that out. Um, what is up with uh ESVN. I'm completely Ooh. out of like I haven't I even I barely watched any Red Sox. Uh yeah, wow. the Celtics started the playoffs last night. Yeah, they that's that's maybe the most lopsided series ago. in the in the whole uh, all of the playoffs if Giannis actually has some time uh, away uh from from the box but like yeah really exciting game ones uh in the NBA. We'll be talking about that at length uh today on ESVN but also giving our NHL playoff preview. Bradley and I are on opposing sides of the series, Whoa. which is what's exciting Rangers about this. Devils. Rangers Devils <laughs> for seven games, maybe. I mean, we'll see. Hopefully the Rangers make quick work of them. But um, we'll be speaking about that, youtube.com slash ESPN show. And uh, Matt Leck, as you know, uh, on like week 47 <laughs> of his grand jury. I don't know what he looks like anymore. <laughs> is this the last week? Yes, should be. Should be. Should be. Friday. We'll see about that. Yeah, let's, we'll be, you know, TBD. <laughs> For all we know, it ended like three weeks. <laughs> I know. Wouldn't that, that have been amazing if he just, like, made this whole Hooky. thing up? I know. It'd be yeah. hilarious if, like, <laughs> like, somebody's like, I ran into Matt today. What? Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah, no, I was up in Cape Cod. I ran into Matt. <laughs> Matt, sitting on the beach. <laughs> um, but uh, Left Reckoning uh, continues because uh, you get out of, yeah, yeah, yeah. get out early on the grand mm -hmm. jury. Days are short these days. Uh, well, so he'll play Tuesday night, so he'll, he'll be back. All you get to see him and David on tomorrow night, youtube.com slash left reckoning. Uh, 646 257 20. 646 257 3920. Uh, we will see you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646 257 3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. well, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back. I just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar. What a, whoa, what a, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. Bring back nightmare. 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 Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. You see, white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. 
Snowflake says what? What 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this psych and the alpha males are back 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 and the africans are black 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 african and the alpha males are black 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 and the africans are back 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 Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! My birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are black, black. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are black, black. Africans are black. to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy, total pussy, 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 pussy. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. I am uh, just filling in for a couple of days. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> All out of bubblegum. Terrific job, Emma and Bradley, while Sam was gone. Once again, proving the boss is unnecessary and only there to extract profit. I have a guest recommendation. Vina Dubal, professor at UC Law San Francisco. Her recent study found that rideshare companies use driver data 